Good morning, welcome everyone to the Menachem Begin Heritage Centre. Um, my name is Paul Gross, I'm a senior fellow at the Centre and uh, it's a real pleasure um, to be hosting this event uh, in conjunction with uh, Dr. Rafael Medoff and the author of this uh, wonderful new book uh, which is available outside, you have seen if you've not yet purchased a copy, there'll be a chance to do that throughout the day. Um, I, it's, a, it's a fantastic turnout um, for this uh, for this event, which I think is testament to um, how fascinating the topic is and how relevant um, the questions it poses still are. Those of you, um, I think many of you are familiar with with the work that we do here at the centre, uh, commemorating, preserving, and teaching about the life and legacy of Menachem Begin, the sixth prime minister, and you will be aware, I'm sure, of the. Um, the degree to which the degree to which the Holocaust had an impact on Menachem Begin's life, and on his thinking, on decisions that he made, um, and on uh, really a way that he thought about um, the world and the, and the state of Jewish people um, throughout his life. Um, you'll also know, I'm sure, that he was both um, a huge supporter and admirer of uh, the American Jewish community and its importance. Um, in the Jewish world and its relationship with, um, with the state of Israel, and also at times someone who was at um, loggerheads with uh, American presidents. Um, so uh, something we'll hear about um, very much uh, today, certainly, with regard to uh, uh, President Roosevelt. Um, we're going to have a, a four sessions, four, uh, more, four wonderful speakers, and also some guest speakers, um, I'm gonna, we're going to start with the author of this book and the man who really initiated this event um, who we are very happy to welcome back here to the centre having done an event last year with him. I think some of you may have been here for that, um, for that event, the screening of a documentary about the American diplomat, James McDonald. Um, uh, Dr. Rafael Medoff is the founding director of the David S. Wyman Institute for Holocaust Studies in Washington, D.C. He's the author of more than 20 books, hundreds of articles about the Holocaust Zionism in American Jewish history, and we're really very happy to have him with us here today, and we should welcome him. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, everyone. First, I want to apologize. I know that some of you came a little extra early because there had been um, a last minute change in the schedule. So um, I want you to know I appreciate very much your patience in, in sticking around for what I know will be a very uh, informative and interesting conference. It is a delight to be back here at the Menachem Begin Heritage Center. When I last spoke here uh, a year ago in conjunction with the, the film by Shuli Eschel, who was with us, about uh, Ambassador James McDonald. <coughs> the very end of that event, at the very end of the Q&A, the final question was, uh, what do you think about American Jewry's response to the Holocaust? And I said, well, that's a kind of a broad question. It's more than I can really answer all regular chad, but as a matter of fact, I'm working on another book about the subject. Should be ready in about a year. And uh, who knows, maybe the Begin Center will host uh, another conference on the subject of that book. And you know, I was only half kidding. Lo and behold, we're back here a year later. So thank you to Herzl Makov, to Paul Gross, to Ariel Morali, to all the staff um, of the Begin Center for making this possible, for taking me seriously when I said that. A, another good friend and colleague of mine who was with us today um, gave me a, a very helpful bit of advice many years ago, around the time of the, when I first began doing public speaking on these subjects. Uh, Binyamin Korn, would you raise your hand, who is was the editor of several important American Jewish weekly newspapers, um, and who has been a colleague of mine who worked at the Wyman Institute for many years. <coughs> he, he mentioned to me that his father, his late father, uh, Bertram 
Korn, Bertram W. Korn, a noted historian and very prominent rabbi, he had a, 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 um, a method of beginning his weekly sermons. And he would always, he would always begin the sermons with a joke. The joke didn't necessarily have anything to do with the content of the sermon would follow, that would follow, but Binyamin pointed out to me that this was a way of sort of getting the, the congregation in a lighter mood before the rabbi ventured into a more serious subject. Now, I appreciated that tip because, as I say, I was a novice at public speaking at that point, but the prospect of, of having an appropriate joke before speaking about the Holocaust didn't seem um, too likely. Not the kind of subject matter where I could find a joke. But if you labor long enough in archives and other, and other, and other collections of documents, eventually um, you will find even the occasional joke. And believe it or not, I, I, I have, and I will begin my remarks today with two jokes. They're not jokes about the Holocaust, of course, but they're jokes that shed light in their own way on two of the key themes of this book. The relationship between President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the American Jewish community, and the personality of Rabbi Stephen S. Wise, Wise the most prominent American Jewish leader of that era. So here goes. The first one goes like this. This was, this was a, a quip invented by a, a prominent Jewish Republican in the 1930s, commenting on the level of support of American Jews for President Roosevelt. He said, it's a play on the Yiddish word for world, Welt. He said, the Jews seem to have three Welten, three worlds. Die Welt, this world. Yenna Welt, the world to come, and Roosevelt. <laughs> The level of uh, electoral support that American Jews gave to President Roosevelt uh, in, in all four of his presidential campaigns is astounding. Um, it was about 90%. Our, the, the polling methods that we had that were available then are not as precise as now, but I, it seems to be a, a reasonable estimate. 90 or more percent of American Jews voted for FDR each time. Now, Here's a joke about Rabbi Stephen Wise and Sigmund Freud. And it goes like this. <clears throat> Freud, had, Freud and Wise met at some point around 1936. And this is actually a joke, but it's also an anecdote, and it's from a reliable source, as we'll see in a moment. Freud said to Wise, who would you say were the five most influential Jews in human history? Wise thought for a moment, and he said, well, Moses, Jesus, Marx, Einstein, and Brandeis. Five most influential Jews in history. Freud said to Rabbi Wise, Rabbi, I noticed you did not include your name on the list, to which Wise said, no, 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 no. And Freud replied, if you had said no one time, I would have believed you. <laughs> now the funny thing is the source for this anecdote is Wise himself. Wise thought it was so amusing, even though it, it makes him look like, you know, kind of an egomaniac. Um, he thought it was so amusing and um, that he himself told this to reporters, and it ended up in a few American Jewish newspapers, and that's how we know about it today. <laughs> but the phenomenon of an American Jewish leader with an enormous ego, um, by no means unique to Rabbi Wise, is something that ultimately plays a very important role in the events that I described in The Jews Should Keep Quiet. We are gathered here today on the 81st anniversary of uh, the Kristallnacht pogrom. When so many windows of Jewish homes and businesses in Germany were shattered that the amount of glass, the amount of glass that was broken that night was said to have equaled one half of the annual production of plate glass from Belgium, where 
most of Germany's glass region. Think of that. And of course, the human toll of Kristallnacht was much worse than broken windows. Hundreds of shoals burned to the ground. 30,000 Jews pulled off to concentration camps. Nearly 100 Jews murdered in those German government orchestrated uh, outbursts of violence. Until Kristallnacht, President Roosevelt had never mentioned the plight of Germany's, Ger Germany's Jews. Never publicly mentioned it. He was elected, he, he assumed office in January 1933. He held, by the fall of 38, he held over 300 press conferences. He never, men never once mentioned the escalating discrimination and persecution uh, experienced by Jews in Nazi Germany. It was only in the aftermath of the Kristallnacht pogrom that we had the first occasion on which Roosevelt mentioned the Jews. And yet he didn't mention the Jews. That's the remarkable thing about FDR's condemnation of Kristallnacht. Let it be noted before I put on the screen the actual transcript of his press conference, let it be noted that the president held a press conference two days after Kristallnacht and said nothing. Said nothing. He was asked by a reporter, Mr. President, do you want to comment on the, on the events in Germany over the last few days? And he said, no, I have nothing to say. Discuss it with the State Department. The president did not want to talk about the issue at all. However, there was such an international outcry, it was, after all, front page news throughout the country, throughout the world. And there were so many you know, condemnations, not only from American Jews, but from church leaders and other prominent public figures, that um, after a number of days, the president's advisors thought it would be a good idea for him to say something. Most history books that cover this episode that I'm describing will tell you that the president forcefully condemned the pogrom, and he was the only world leader to do so. And it's true that other Western leaders were afraid, even at that point, to directly criticize the German government. <clears throat> but that's primarily because they lived near Germany. The leaders of Britain and France and other European countries were terrified of angering Hitler in any way, so they wouldn't even issue an explicit verbal condemnation of this massive violence. So it's true, technically, that FDR was the only Western leader to address it explicitly. <clears throat> and yet, the notion that he forcefully condemned it, therefore, and therefore that that response was admirable, noteworthy, I would say um, does not adequately explain what actually happened. If you go, if you happen to visit the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, currently they're running a, a new exhibit called Americans and the Holocaust, and there's a large section, large panel, about the president's response to Crystal. Now, it is portrayed as if he was outspoken and bold and, <clears throat> and unique in his forceful words. But let's see what he actually said. He said, as you can see, the news of the past few days from Germany has deeply shocked public opinion in the United States. Such news from any part of the world would inevitably produce a similar profound reaction among American people in every part of the nation. I myself could scarcely believe that such things could occur in the 20th century civilization. With a view to gaining a first-hand picture of the current situation, I have asked the Secretary of State to order our ambassador in Berlin to return at once for a report. And that's it. Now notice what's missing here. There's no Jews, and also, there's no Nazis. There's no reference to Hitler. There's no reference to the German government, to the Nazi leadership, to Hitler himself. No Jews, no Nazis. What I found in my research is that this was no, no mere accident but that this is a reflection of a consistent, consistent policy by President Roosevelt and his administration, something which is not reflected in other history books. A consistent policy to maintain cordial and sometimes even friendly relations with the Nazi German government prior to World War II. Notice at the very end of this excerpt from the transcript, a reporter asked, would you elaborate on that, sir? And he responded, no, I think it speaks for itself. He didn't want to say another word about it. 
He did not want to directly, publicly criticize the Hitler government. The policy of the administration was to maintain consistent, steady, economic and diplomatic relations with Germany. He does say he's recalling the ambassador for report and consultation, but it's not recall. He's ordering him to come back for report and consultation. But when asked by a reporter subsequently, does that mean he's being recalled as if there's a, is there a suspension of relations between, diplomatic relations between the US and Germany? And the answer is no. Relations between the US and Nazi Germany were never suspended or or uh, altered in any way during this period. When I refer to the fact that trade continued between the US and Nazi Germany during the 1930s, as you'll see in the book, it went, the administration went to even the following lengths to preserve the friendship, this, this friendly relationship with the Germans. As I'm sure you, you know, during the 1930s, the American Jewish community maintained, organized and maintained and promoted a nationwide boycott of German goods. And there were picket lines in front of Macy's in, in, you know, in, in Midtown Manhattan when they carried German furs, for example, or other products. The Roosevelt administration quietly allowed the German government to disguise the labels that appear on German products which were coming to America. They were allowed, and this was unique among America's trading partners. They were allowed to have a label which instead of saying made in Germany and thus revealing its origins to a, a potential uh, consumer, they were allowed to put made in the, in the name of the city where it, it was produced. Something that obviously many consumers would not necessarily recognize as being in Germany. They were also allowed to, to physically place the label in such a way that it was almost impossible to read. This was, this, this was the policy of the administration which was, ex which was halted only when it was exposed, when American Jewish boycott activists became aware of it in 1937 and threatened to sue and blow it wide open. At that point, the administration required the Germans to return to the normal label. <laughs> in the aftermath of Kristallnacht and this rather weak condemnation by President Roosevelt, the burning question for Rabbi Stephen Wise and other American Jewish leaders, and indeed for the entire American Jewish community, was what would be done? What would the administration be willing to do on a practical level to try to aid the Jews in Nazi Germany? The immigration quota from Germany, which was about 26,000 annually, was almost never filled during the years that President Roosevelt was in office. During his 12 years in the White House, the quota from Germany was filled only once. And most of those years, it was less than 25% filled. This was part of another deliberate policy by the Roosevelt administration to suppress Jewish immigration far below what the existing law allowed. But the one year that it was filled was the year 1938-1939. It was such an overwhelming demand not beginning with Kristallnacht, actually beginning earlier after the Anschluss, the German annexation of Austria. It was a tremendous um, effort by German and Austrian Jews to find a haven anywhere, including the United States. That's the one year, because of the international pressure and outcry, the one year that the president allowed the quota to be filled. A few months after Kristallnacht, when the infamous refugee ship, the St. Louis, approached America's shore, this question of what would the administration practically be willing to do, this, this dilemma was vividly placed before the American public and American Jewry. Because here was a ship with 930 German refugees hovering right off the coast of Florida, sending desperate telegrams to the White House, please, Mr. President, allow us in. Now, as I said, the quota was filled that year. So it's not as if the president could have simply waved, you know, waved a magic wand and, and allowed them to be admitted. But that doesn't mean that there were no other options. After all, the world had just witnessed the horrors of Kristallnacht. It was clear what it would mean for Jews to be trapped in Germany, or in this case, to be sent back to Germany. And just because the quota to the mainland U.S. was full does not mean that that was the only option. 
This is a, an image of the U.S. Virgin Islands. As the St. Louis hovered off the coast of Florida, <coughs> Treasury Secretary Henry Morgenthau Jr. pictured here, with the president, the only Jew in, in FDR's cabinet. He proposed to the Secretary of State, who then discussed it with the president, the idea of allowing the refugees from St. Louis to go temporarily to the Virgin Islands. The proposal was to allow them to enter on tourist visas, which were good for six months. Maybe by then it'd be safe to go to Germany, back to Germany, or maybe by then another haven could be found. So it was a temporary solution, but it was a way to, to avoid sending back these 930 Jews to the inferno that Nazi Germany had become. Morgan Paul proposed it to Secretary of State Cordell Hall. He discussed it with the president. Hall came back to Morgan Paul. And we have a transcript of these conversations. <sighs> Morgan Paul kept transcripts of all of his telephone conversations, his professional telephone conversations during that era. So we know what actually transpired. Hull came back, Secretary of State Hull came back to Morgenthau and said, sorry, I discussed this with the president, but there's no way we can allow, allow these people in temporarily. Because, he said, in order to qualify for a tourist visa, you had to have a return address, a home address to which you could, you could and would return after the tourist visa expired. These people don't have a safe place to go back to, so how can we let them in? <laughs> Ultimate catch-22. We can't let them in because they have no place to go back to, so we're going to send them back to the place where they have nowhere to go. And when, when FDR turned away the St. Louis, when, when he said no, and the ship began making its way back across the Atlantic, as far as he knew, it was going back to Nazi Germany. It happens in the end, as we know, that during that voyage back across the Atlantic, four European countries agreed to admit the passengers of the St. Louis. England, France, Holland, Belgium. Even then, even then people realized that going back to other countries um, on the European continent was not the safest proposition. It was a lot better than going back to Nazi Germany. And to be sure, the passengers on the St. Louis were greatly relieved that they were not returned to Hamburg, but instead were, were going to be um, disembarking in those, in those other countries. But, of course, as we know, less than a year later, Holland, France, Belgium were overrun by the Germans. Only the, the only St. Louis passengers who survived as a group were those who went to England. The ones who went to France, Belgium, and Holland um, were murdered in approximately the same proportion as the rest of the Jews in those countries. American policy toward Nazi Germany um, did not change until America went to war with Germany. One of the interesting things about working in this field <clears throat> is that no matter how many books you write, no matter how many articles you write, or how many lectures you give, there's always something new to be discovered. And I have, um, I've had this interesting experience over the years where I write a book, and then sure enough, like a week later, or a month later, I find some new piece of information I wish I had put in this book. And this book has only been out for a few months, and sure enough, I found already several more interesting things that I wish I had included, and I want to share those with you today. Each of them, in its own way, sheds a little more light on what you'll read in the book. The first has to do with the subject of U.S.-German trade. Um, it turns out that in the 1930s, it was another area in which the administration was quietly allowing the Germans to have trade advantages. But it, this only came out later. People often ask me, why, why would 90% of American Jews, why did they support Roosevelt? given all of the things that I'm describing about Roosevelt's abandonment of the Jews. And a large part of that answer is they didn't know at the time. These things were not well publicized at the time. I'm speaking broadly, but, but overall, that was, the, um, that was a major part of the reason. Here, now the example I'm about to tell you about trade, this is something which was going on in the 30s, but was not discovered until 1944. This is where I found it. Um, the old New York City newspaper, PM, did an expose in 1944. 
they discovered that, um, that the administration, the Roosevelt administration during the 1930s was quietly allowing the Germans to get around a, um, a, a restriction on foreign subsidies of goods that were exported to the US. Congress had passed a law that would impose an extra tariff on countries that subsidize their products in order to make them more competitive in the, with, the, with the American market. And the German cases was, had mostly to do with cotton and copper exports to the US. The German government, the Nazi government, was, was, was um, subsidizing these products um, in order to improve their, uh, their value on the, on the market, their competitiveness on the market. That it turned out the State Department was not applying the tariffs. These tariffs were specifically intended by Congress in an early period when it was enacted in order to penalize these foreign countries so they wouldn't be able to get away with this kind of subsidizing, which was unfair to, to the American, you know, American manufacturers. But the State Department decided that the, the administration decided that it didn't want to ruffle Hitler's feathers. So it never imposed these tariffs. Other countries were hit with these tariffs. Germans were quietly exempt, it seems, from these penalties. All, again, for the sake of preserving a, the relationship between the US and Nazi Germany. So that's one, one interesting thing that I came across. Here's a second. As you'll see in the book, Stephen Wise had an extraordinary range of responsibilities in his position as a Jewish leader. He was the head, officially or unofficially, founder of the American Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress, the American Zionist movement, his synagogue, the Free Synagogue, his rabbinical institute, the Jewish Institute of Religion. It's five Jewish institutions that he headed simultaneously. It turns out it wasn't all. I didn't know this until recently, but it turns out that he was also head of the chaplaincy committee of the New York Board of Jewish Ministers. Today it's called the New York Board of, Jew Board of Rabbis. He was head of the chaplaincy committee. And I guess it's admirable that he was willing to take on so many responsibilities, but he wasn't just the chairman in name. What I found is I found that he was actually chairing meetings and you know, running this committee starting in 1938, the year of Kristallnacht. Continuing for at least three years, maybe longer. What's remarkable about this is why, how did he find the time, which is to say, how did he justify in his mind taking away his attention from obviously more burning issues such as the persecution of Jews in Europe and spending his time chairing this chaplaincy committee? This was a feature of Wise's personality which did not serve him well during the years under discussion, and which put him at a, at a disadvantage in many ways. He couldn't relinquish power. He became so accustomed, so entrenched in his positions as the, the most prominent leader of American Jewry, he just could not con conceive of giving way, of letting, letting in someone, someone younger, he was 64 and in poor health, letting someone, letting, you know, allowing someone who was younger, who was in better health, who was more energetic, allowing in younger leaders who might be able to fill the vacuum that was necessarily left by the fact that he spread himself so thin all over the place. As we know, uh, and as we're going to hear more about in a moment, as we know, others in the Jewish community tried to fill the vacuum that Rabbi Wise had left. Precisely because Rabbi Wise could not find it in himself to directly challenge President Roosevelt. To, conf to speak truth to power, to say to Roosevelt that there's something wrong with this policy of keeping out Jewish refugees, of, of friendly relations with Nazi Germany in the 30s, of refusing to bomb the railway tracks to Auschwitz in the 40s. He could not bring himself to take those positions. When you look at the cover of the book, by the way, this is a case where you can judge a book by its cover. You notice something interesting when you look close at the two images of FDR and Rabbi Wise. They're from two separate photos. Now, as you may imagine, I would have preferred, and the publisher would have preferred, to have a photo of the two of them together, since this book is about their relationship. In this book, I, we look at the American Jewish response to the Holocaust through the prism of their relationship. 
As far as we can tell, there is not a single existing photo of Wise and Roosevelt together. None of the archives have them. There are three major collections of Wise's papers and photos. There's one here in Jerusalem, the Central Zionist Archives. There's one in New York, and there's one in Cincinnati. None of them had a photo of Wise and Roosevelt together. It's clear to me, President Roosevelt did not want to be photographed with Wise. He didn't want to give him that attention. Even Wise couldn't even get what we today call a photo op, not even one photo op with the president because the president did not want to draw the public's attention to the plight of the Jews, to the calls to rescue the Jews or let them in. He allowed Wise into the White House on occasion, but in essentially it was through the back door. When 400 Orthodox rabbis marched to the White House before Yom Kippur in 1943, organized by the activists known as the Bergson Group, Roosevelt used that back door to which I just alluded. He literally left the White House through the back door because he did not want to be seen with those rabbis. The same thing, when, you're, when the president is photographed with either rabbi wise or with the 400 protesters, it gives them credibility. It makes them legitimate. It catapults their demand, their protest, into the news. So those 400 rabbis who marched to the White House in the only such protest in the nation's capital during the Holocaust, they too, they too could not, could not get even a brief meeting with the President of the United States. Among our speakers later today, I should note, um, is Nathan Lewin, the distinguished constitutional attorney, who will be talking about his father, whose many activities during the Holocaust period including, included participating in this march to the White House. But we are now going to hear from Professor Rebecca Cook of Ben Gurion University, who's the daughter of Hillel Cook, better known as Peter Bergson, the leader of the Bergson Group activists who organized that march of rabbis and did so much else to try to shatter the curtain of silence surrounding, um, surrounding the Nazi genocide. Dr. Cook um, is a professor of political science who has um, who has studied her father's work, his efforts to promote rescue during the Holocaust. And although she's unable to be with us in this room today, we're very grateful that she will appear now via Skype and share a few words with us. After which, after which we'll have a general Q&A before we break for lunch. for organizing this really important conference and for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts um, with you today. Um, Rafa, we've known each other for a long time and I've read the uh, make me think and they always raise really, really important and thought-provoking questions and your talk today is uh, did the same, it raised a lot of very thought-provoking ideas and thought-provoking questions uh, that really touch on issues that are of great importance and that were very, very important to my father, Hillel Cook. So um, my father, uh, Hillel Cook, was not one to dwell in the past. If you know this about him, but people who knew him knew that. In that sense, he was very much a representative of his own generation. Um, they were doers. They were men and women of history. Um, and in that sense, for him, and I think for many people of this generation, um, history was only important to the extent that it had very clear implications for the present and for the future. That was for him, for many, many years, I think for the purpose of life, that was the only implication given in the past. 
if you could really draw some very kind of concrete and significant uh, connections between the past, what would you learn from this from that? Um, and my father, for most of his life after World War II, after um, uh, after his his efforts um, at rescue, he didn't deal with history. He didn't deal with the past. He was very deeply engaged uh, in Israeli society and politics. Um, he was elected in 1949, and the war was elected um, to Israel's Constituent Assembly, which later uh, came and was transformed into Israel's first parliament. And uh, during his term, he was dedicated, and the reason that he used to say that the only reason he agreed to be elected to the Constituent Assembly was that he was dedicated to the idea of the Constitution. Um, and he was committed to promoting an open and honest discourse about the nature of the, what he called the Israeli public Republic and what he thought were fundamental issues about Israeli identity, issues that a constitution needed to deal with. What kind of society um, would be established? What kind of state would be established? What kind of regime? What would be the nature of the Israeli identity? What would be the relationship between religion and state? And most importantly, you might talk about what would be the relationship religion and nationality. So um, it's in this context, it's really this um, tireless effort to promote a discourse surrounding fundamentals that led my father later in the list of life, and probably most specifically in 1984 when he met Professor Wyman, who was doing research for his monument for book of the Jews. Um, it was that tireless effort and that reputation that brought him to deal once again with the past and with a history that was so so dramatic at very many levels. Because for my father, and this is uh, something, and anyone who knew him, the fact that the leadership of world Jewry never faced the past honestly, never engaged in what he called a cheshbon nefesh, was the main obstacle, one of the main obstacles, that prevented Israel from dealing and engaging openly with its own fundamental issues. Um, for him, Koch, the leadership of world Jewelry needed to, and still needs to today, to acknowledge their betrayal of European Jewelry at their time of deepest and most dire need. For him, this betrayal exposed what he called the myth of Jewish unity. And it also exposed misconceptions regarding Jewish identity. It uncovered the fact that while Jews might share a religious identity, in this age of nationalism and national sovereignty, they belonged and they belonged to different national and political communities. They had and they continue to have different political interests. Um, and we clearly know today how this issue of um, of Jewish unity or lack of Jewish unity, what distinguishes between two different Jewish communities uh, around the world is a very, very important issue, one that we still haven't dealt with um, adequately. So for my father, the continued failure of American and Israeli leadership to engage with this part of our history is preventing Israel from still dealing with those same fundamental issues that my father spoke of 50, 40, 30, and 20 years ago. What should the relationship be between religion and nationality? For whom does the state of Israel exist? And what is the nature of the relationship between American Jewry and the American Jewish community and the state of Israel? And most importantly, probably, how can we create an honest, democratic, and open relationship between the state of Israel and the Israeli nation and the rest of the world Jewry? So I guess, Dr. Menefit, my question to you, is what do you think are the main connections of this history? Uh, what do you think that we learn from this history? Uh, and maybe if you feel like it, we can also hear a little bit from you about what you think the purpose of history in general is. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next generation 
of, of American Jews, especially the, the, the younger generation, learned a very important lesson. The Soviet Jewry protest movement of the 1960s and 1970s is exactly what, in their minds, in the minds of the activists in that movement, exactly what should have been done by their parents' generation. So let's start with that. Um, the, um, the model of Hillel Cook and the Bergson Group taking out newspaper ads, marching to the White House, lobbying Congress, these were things that were that American Jewish leaders did not do for Soviet Jewry in the 1950s or 1960s. It was only when a, a wave of young activists, um, beginning with the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, began using these kinds of tactics that the whole plight of Soviet Jewry started to become a major issue for the American Jewish community and beyond. I have had the opportunity um, during the course of my research to interview a number of the early activists for Soviet Jewry in the United States. Um, one of them, by the way, is sitting right here in the front row. He's Earl Winky Maydad was among, the, um, among those who, with whom I've discussed. What was it that drove the young, the young activists of Students Trouble for Soviet Jewry, Beitar, and other groups? What drove them to, um, to undertake the kind of activism that they did? And, and I've often, they said to me that their awareness of American Jewish leaders in action during the Holocaust was, uh, was something that they felt was a kind of a badge of shame for the American Jewish community, and they did not want to respond, repeat that mistake. And, they, and, and many of them knew about the activities of the Bergson Group and did look to Hillel Cook and the, and the Bergson Group as a kind of an inspiration for their own, for their own protests. The second um, group in the American Jewish community that I would say had, you know, to a certain extent, also learned the lessons from that silence are the pro-Israel activists. The idea of having an APAC, for example, um, is something that was unknown in the 1940s. The Bergson Group tried to fill that vacuum, but of course it didn't have the resources or the connections of the major establishment Jewish groups. So although Bergson and his colleagues did their best and did a, a, a very impressive job of lobbying in Washington, they, they were not in a position to do what, for example, Rabbi Wise could have done if the mainstream groups had had a, a, a full-time functioning Jewish lobby in Washington the way, um, the way to, to do the kinds of things that APAC and other pro-Israel organizations have done in Washington um, in our own time. So in those two ways, so Jewry activism, pro-Israel activism, it's clear that there are those who have learned some of the important lessons from um, the relative apathy of, of Rabbi Wise and other Jewish leaders during the Holocaust. Still, um, I think it's also fair to say that there are ways, unfortunately, in which the American Jewish leadership has not changed significantly from that period long ago. Still today, um, the American Jewish community uh, suffers from, for example, a lack of democracy. The leaders of American Jewish organizations are not elected democratically. This was a problem in, in Rabbi Wise's era. I alluded earlier to the problem of Wise not being willing to give way to younger, more dynamic leaders who might have been more effective in challenging Roosevelt's Jewish refugee policies. Other, leader, other potential leaders in the 1940s never had the opportunity. They couldn't compete to challenge Wise because the American Jewish Congress, the World Jewish Congress, the others, they didn't hold democratic elections. It wasn't as if Jews could vote for their leaders. Um, and that is still largely the case today. American Jewish leaders are unelected. And as we know, when someone is unelected and they simply are becoming entrenched in a position of power, and that position brings with it lavish salary, all kinds of perks, meetings with VIPs, it becomes a very comfortable and attractive um, role to play, and it becomes very hard for younger activists to rise up in the ranks and to have their shot at and their turn at trying to build a, a you know, more effective um, and healthier American Jewish community. So that is one, one area, a lack of democracy, where it seems to me that things have not changed um, in, 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 the way, in ways that would be better for American Jewry. 
Um, Becky, I don't know if I've really answered your question, but uh, it was a broad question and, and one which I hope that we'll all continue to think about and consider um, in the aftermath of this conference, because what Dr. Cook has raised here is exactly what her father did to present provocative um, and original thinking to the public, to raise ideas that other people didn't, didn't think about. The idea of marching, of, of organizing rabbis to march to the White House in 1943 was completely inconceivable to the established Jewish leadership. It took a complete outsider, Hillel Cook and his colleagues, coming from Eretz Israel, coming from, um, and in a few cases, from Europe. But these were the leaders of the works group were not Americans. Um, and, they, and they didn't think in strictly American terms, and they weren't worried about if the things they did might cause anti-Semitism in America. They were original thinkers, brilliant young men and women who raised, um, who raised provocative new ideas and injected fresh thinking into the American Jewish community then. And I appreciate very much that Dr. Cook, in that sense as well, is carrying on her father's legacy of trying to get us to think about an important question that sometimes um, we may find uncomfortable. So thank you again, Becky, for your remarks. And we have time before lunch break for some questions. Is there a, um, is there a handheld mic in the audience? If not, I'll pass this one. So whoever asks the first question will get this mic, and I'll ask you to keep passing it on. Who's ever next? We'll start right here in the front row. I'm going to turn this to you and then ask you to pass it back as we continue. Well, I really appreciate your work. Here. Thank you. I really appreciate uh, your bringing this great um, series to, to our, our focus. My name is Abraham Reich, and I moved from Baltimore to Israel six years ago. And I'm fascinated by this topic of uh, response from American Jews to the Holocaust. And I see that so far, from what I've heard, our focus seems to be on uh, certain Jewish leaders and the organizations that they represent, that they uh, could have done more, could have said more, could have protested more. I'm wondering, to what degree do you think those Jewish leaders and their organizations were simply a reflection of the mass of American Jews at that time? That perhaps the Jew of the 1930s and 40s saw himself uh, not so much as an entitled citizen of the USA, but rather as a guest. A guest that if he towed the line and did all the right things, pursued higher education, a better job, he could then have the American dream of a home in the suburbs with a two-car garage. But if he spoke out and ruffled feathers, that the American people might not accept him. So I'd like to briefly hear your opinion about the the sociology, the mentality of American Jews at that time. The American Jewish community in the 1930s and 1940s consisted overwhelmingly of either immigrants or children of immigrants. So you are certainly correct when you allude to the fact that for many American Jews, the um, overriding aspiration was to simply be accepted as Americans. And as we know, anti-Semitism reached an all-time high in American history during that period. There were more than 100 active anti-Semitic organizations around the country. Public opinion polls showed widespread prejudice against Jews. And so it was an atmosphere that in many ways was intimidating. So that, that is true. However, it is also true, and you'll see in the book, I have found that consistently throughout this period, it was the grassroots Jews, average American Jews, not those in leadership positions, um, who again and again pressed leadership to take a more forceful, more outspoken stance on Jewish issues. Of course, there were, was a minority, and no doubt there was a minority, um, especially among those who were, were German-born or German-descended, um, who were more assimilated, 
and did not want to have anything to do with the Jewish community, and who, for example, embraced anti-Zionism in the 1940s and created that anti-Zionist organization, the American Council for Judaism. But, by and large, I found again and again evidence that um, Jews at the grassroots level wanted their leaders to be more active. And I, you f I find this in different ways. First of all, you can find it in American Jewish press, in, in Jewish weekly newspapers. You'll find it you know, in, in, in articles, in letters to the editor, sometimes editorials in smaller Jewish papers crying out, why are our Jewish leaders, why are they silent? Um, and the Bergson Group, one of the many interesting things about the Bergson Group is that it had an enormous following. It wasn't a membership organization per se. Um, it was an emergency committee. It was intended to be a temporary organization and address the, the, the raging Holocaust in Europe. Um, but they, in the ads that they took out, they sponsored more than 200 full-page ads in American newspapers during, between 1940 and 1945. In their ads, there was always a coupon at the, bottom, at the bottom where you could send in a donation. And my interviews with, with former Berkson Group leaders, they told me that they received an enormous number of $1 donations. People would just send in a dollar as a gesture of support. Where's a dollar? It's worth more those days than it is today. Still, so it was like a token of support, the, almost the equivalent of membership dues, because people did identify with it. Um, and, um, and so there's no doubt in my mind that, in fact, um, had Jewish leaders listened to the voice of the masses, or had they had democratic elections, and therefore had the masses been able to express themselves in the voting booths, that um, there would have been a very different response from American Jewish leadership, from the American Jewish leadership. Thank you. Okay, can you pass the mic back, please? The lady there, three rows up. I'd like to know your thoughts about the American Jewish leadership now, because as the previous questioner referred to, perhaps there was a fear that they were newcomers and so on. But in my opinion, the American Jewish organized leadership today is also suffering from a great inability or reluctance to stand up and be heard in a way that may cause conflict for Jews, for the Jewish state in particular, and I think specifically about the reaction of elected Jews in leadership to the Iran deal, for example. What are your thoughts on that? The reason historians tend to shy away from commenting on current politics is because we are trained to believe that if we wait long enough, more you know, documents, records, archives will become available and then we'll be able to get the full story. So I would hesitate to draw as a story. I hesitate to draw any conclusions based on you know, a snapshot of the present because I know that one day when we see the full record of what was going on behind the scenes um, within Jewish organizations, within the Jewish community, in contacts between the Jewish organizations and, and the, the president or the, or the Congress, that then we'll finally have the full story. I did mention earlier that I think, in, in general, that um, the American Jewish community today would be a lot healthier if it subscribed to the same principles of democracy that American Jews cherish as American citizens. And I, and I, I will reiterate that because whatever your position might be on any particular issue, whether you mentioned the Iran deal or anything else, for me, it all starts with, well, what, do, what, are the, what does the community want? What do, what do average members of, 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 of synagogues, of community centers, uh, people who are, who are affiliated with different Jewish organizations, what do they want? For me, it all starts with that. Um, if American Jews were able to, to choose their leaders, if to choose the leaders who reflected their views, it might not be what many of us would like. It might be. I don't know. Um, but that's what I would like to see, first of all, the, the democratization of American Jewry, so that instead of a self-appointed leadership, people who think they know best and then speak on behalf of the community whether or not they really represent it, instead of that, 
we'd have a leadership that genuinely represented the Jewish community. And therefore, in its dealings with Congress, the President, whomever, would authentically represent the views of the constituents who they, who they claim to represent. Can you pass the microphone? Thank you. Uh, I have two questions for you. Uh, my name is Doug Altebeff. I'm here with my wife and some friends. Very interesting discussion. We look forward to reading the book. I actually started reading the book. The first question is simply, uh, why do you think Roosevelt was so solicitous, obsequious maybe, towards uh, German relationships until the very end? And, and the second question, really sort of picking up on the, the comment just made, uh, there's a thread here, a very interesting thread between uh, Hillel Cook and the Bergson Group, the students for uh, Soviet Jewry, uh, and and maybe what some things that are going on today, and that is the power of grassroots uh, organizations, the out of the box nature of grassroots organizations. I, I have the privilege of serving as the chairman of the largest grassroots Zionist organization in Israel, and I see it firsthand how how un, uh, accountable, except to the citizens of the country, groups managed to find a great and powerful voice. Uh, and the voice that you're talking about in the case of the Bergson Group, in the case of the students in the 70s, was completely doing an end, round, uh, uh, end run around elected leadership, no matter how they were elected. Uh, and there's something about the wisdom of crowds, so to speak. There's something about the bubbling up. And you talk about that earlier on, about how the, the, the uh, in, in the book, about how the grassroots was pressing Wise to speak out. And he, uh, he, he wouldn't do that. So, I, you know, you might want to reflect a little about that. But I am fascinated by why you think Roosevelt was so obsequious towards the Germans. <laughs> I don't use the word obsequious, but, um, but there's no doubt that he went out of his way to, tr to try to keep from offending Hitler and Hitler's government in any way. And I, I show many examples of that, of course, in the book. Um, the reason I think is, is simple. Presidents don't like to be bothered with questions of human rights issues abroad. No president likes this. <clears throat> It only, the only, t only times in, in American history where human rights have intruded, so to speak, on American foreign policy is when there was tremendous pressure from interest groups. In the case of, of Soviet Jewry, it was the pressure from the Soviet Jewry movements and everything that entailed, which forced the hands of the Nixon administration by bringing about the, the enactment of the Jackson Amendment, which linked the treatment of Soviet Jewry linked that with American Soviet trade. There's only, and other examples in American history where human rights were a factor were never, they're never the result of, a, of the president doing it. Because from a president's point of view, his, 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 um, his priorities do not include whether or not um, people in other countries are abused. It's, it's never, there's never been a president who came into office um, who sincerely intended and then did make human rights around the world a priority. Now, the current president obviously has a greater emphasis on this idea that America is not the world's policeman. The truth is, previous presidents also never wanted America to be the world's policeman. Never really wanted America to get mixed up in other countries' problems. And, and there's a case to be made that maybe it's none of America's business. However, the other, the other side of the coin is, well, if America is already doing trade with one of these horrible regimes, then maybe America does have a moral responsibility to limit that trade or to use it as leverage. That was the argument of the Soviet Jewry protesters. Um, it was essentially the argument of American Jews in the 1930s who were boycotting German products. They wanted the American government also to, to refrain from having trade relations. And a, a lot of this argument came to the fore during the debate over whether or not America should participate in the 1936 Olympics in Berlin. And this, as you'll see in the book, this is one instance in which Rabbi Wise came, was on the side of the activists. He was one of the leaders of the movement to try to bring about a U.S. withdrawal from the Olympic Games. But despite the best efforts of not only Wise, but many other American Jewish um, figures and organizations, 
president absolutely refused. He wanted to maintain those friendly relations with the Nazi, with Nazi Germany. America went and took part in those games, um, despite the fact that it was blatantly obvious that the Germans were going to use the games as a, as a propaganda platform. How do you speculate on why Roosevelt didn't on the death camps? So the question is, why Roosevelt did not um, agree to the many requests to bomb the death camps or the railway tracks leading to them? Before I answer that question, I want to just see how much time we have for a lunch break. It's now 12.02. Um, we're going to be here quite a bit longer after lunch, and so we'll have an opportunity, I'm sure, to discuss that question in detail. So let's, let's now take a break for lunch, and then we'll be back with our next speaker and continue this discussion. Thank you.